My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching or tuning in to another episode of the podcast. My name is David Summerfleck. My guest today is Will Russell. Hi, Will. How's it going where you are in Nuevo York? I'm doing good. Thank you. Uh, as a, it looks like a storm's brewing outside my window, but I'm happy to be here and talking to you today. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. I appreciate your time. And I remember talking to you pre-interview and just had a lot of fun talking to you. So let me go into my brief introduction and then we can hit our questions and go a little bit deeper. So I've got you as a marketing expert specializing in helping entrepreneurs validate their ideas and executing successful launches. Mm -hmm. Having spent the first decade of your career managing launch marketing efforts for businesses of all sizes in the media and nonprofit space. Uh, Will has a unique perspective on the attributes of successful launch campaigns. So in 2016, you entered the e-commerce launch space as a crowdfunding marketing consultant where you achieved rapid success. In response to growing client interest in the need for a larger team, you launched a new digital marketing agency a year later. Your company, Russell Marketing, specializes in e-commerce launch marketing, which I may know a little bit about, utilizing your five-step marketing launch system, which Great. I have my 5D process, so I don't know how yours is mm -hmm. close to mine or not. So let's just jump in. Did I leave anything out? No, that's perfect. Okay. Let me ask you to start at the beginning. Can you discuss your your ed, your professional education, your academic education, you know, if you think that's relevant, basically how you got started and what made you wanted to get started in marketing and then crowdfunding and so on. Sure. Well, I always say that the industry and the career path I've ended up on, I don't think holds much alignment with what I studied. I actually studied philosophy and sociology back in college in the UK, I went to the University of Leeds and uh, on graduation, knew nothing about what I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, I was told by the, the career kind of counseling group, oh, you could do some PR. So I, uh, I did an internship in PR. It was interesting. And that was in London. And, and then I moved to the US. I decided to get, get back, back involved in soccer coaching, which is something I qualified for at school. And I spent a year moving around the US uh, coaching soccer for that same company, dabbling in a little bit of marketing again. And uh, at, the, at the time I arrived in California, which is about a year later, I just needed to get a, 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 a sustainable job really uh, in order to be able to stay in the US and not have to fly home. So I, I managed to find another internship in marketing and, and that's how I got involved in, in the marketing space. It was more a practical thing than a than a passion thing, I suppose. But I quickly grew to like it. Quickly grew to know a lot about it, and I think uh, became quite good at it. And that's how I ended up kind of evolving this launch system, evolving more in the marketing space, and ended up where I am today with with a marketing agency. Do you think that philosophy as an endeavor? as a whole is disconnected from relevance in our day-to-day -day lives? Because I mean, when you talk about being academically educated in philosophy, but then mm -hmm. going into PR and marketing, I mean, mm -hmm. obviously it's, 
I don't know if it's fair to say that there's a disconnect between the two, but there's certainly a mm -hmm. big difference between philosophy as a, as a practice or being philosophical and appreciating mm -hmm. philo philosophy and mm -hmm. then marketing and PR because marketing and PR, even though I do it, there's a lot about it that I don't like mm -hmm. that, that can be a little bit under the table. Like I'm sure you're familiar with Edward Bernays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you and I have a, a slightly different perspective than, than many with regards to this, just in the conversations we've had so far, what I can see on the wall behind you, you know, I think you and I look at life and perhaps career in a slightly different way, certainly a slightly different way than I was brought up to look at life and career. I grew up going to private schools and in private schools, I feel like they're molding you for a particular career path uh, where you, as many, many, many of my friends have done, you get a job in the big city, you commute in on the train, you wear a suit, uh, you work nine to five, you come home. And I knew I never wanted that. That's why I didn't do economics or, and that's why I ended up, I think that's what attracted to me philo to philosophy, a slightly different mindset than many peers. And I don't think there's a, a total disconnect, no, between philosophy and the work we do now. But I don't think that philosophical education was necessary or even a protagonist in the career path I've taken. I think it, I think the way the role philosophy played in education and the way I think about it now, and I think that would be prevalent whatever career path I was doing and it's not a necessity or, or has a close connection mm. to marketing. I think the approach I take with business, which I think we talked about last time, you know, you and I prioritize health and life and, um, the present and focusing on, you know, what's around us rather than, uh, committing our lives too much, you know, to a, to a, to a computer, I guess per se. And, and I think that, that, that philosophy, uh, the philosophy of that education is something that I implement in my business and, and helps the business. But I certainly don't think if I, in hindsight, I don't see too much relationship between the work I did at university and at school and my day to day. Now, I, d I don't know if there's enough of a connection there uh, for me to draw much of a parallel. I think I ended up taking a path that I didn't expect to take. Uh, and philosophies allowed me to do that and allowed me to think about things in a slightly different way than many people might, or some of my peers might, uh, and to a huge benefit, no question. But, but, uh, I think I always, I always consider that the education I had didn't in indicate this kind of, this kind of lifestyle or career path. You know, many of the people that I did sociology with or philosophy with have become teachers, um, work in social policy, uh, gone on to do master's degrees, PhDs, and, and I took a bit of a different path. Yeah, I mean, I went to public school, but back then when I went to school, I mean, back when Caesar was in power, I mean, <laughs> we, we had electives back then. So it was not un, at all unusual to have a music class, advanced literature cl uh, course, uh, you know, sh uh, we had what they call shop where you, you know, working with uh, equipment and home economics where you're cooking and it mm -hmm. wasn't at all unusual. And now I think those are, have all been flensed from the education system in most U.S. schools, certainly in most public schools. But uh, the funny thing is, I mean, I, I never wanted to go into marketing or PR or advertising. I went to school to, because I always loved reading. And I always mm -hmm. loved writing and studied it in college. When I graduated, I after two internships, I quickly realized that there were no jobs that paid a living wage. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, boy, I better learn something else. Um, but I think with so much of PR and marketing, there's this, if you've done it for a long time, or at least worked for several agencies, you very quickly see the shady side of it you know, with the ageism and the discrimination and the practice of it, but also the whole 
the whole approach of social, what's the word, the phrase I'm looking for, social programming. Okay. You know, that's so, um, so big with uh, Facebook. And you mean like the psycholo psychology, psychological tactics kind of thing? Right, absolutely. And um, yeah, Google with the tracking, Facebook with so mm -hmm. much of the, the psychological uh, manipulation of key factors, which is all public public knowledge and mm -hmm. in documentaries such as the social dilemma and coded bias, which I think are on Netflix now, and so on. And certainly, you know, Edward Bernays, for those who don't know, who are watching or listening to this was the nephew of Freud. And where uh, the eight, basically Freud had been approached by marketing and PR people before it wasn't PR, but he had been approached and he said, no, I don't have time for this nonsense. Whereas Bernays said, I'm happy to do what uh, my cousin Ziggy did and we'll apply this to how we can make more money. And that was basically the genesis of public relations as we know it today. Edward Bernays is largely instrumental in starting public relations. Although most of public relations is more being extroverted, conversational, building connections and networking very effectively and being a really, really sharp, quick thinker on your feet. Um, I mean, how do you feel about all that? That's, I think, you know, I'm more, I may be more jaded. Mm -hmm. I think some, it's a big question. I, <clears throat> I think about it a lot. I was working, I quit my job in the media space many years ago, or not that many years ago, it's just eight years ago, maybe nine years ago, and took up a job in nonprofits because I felt that I wanted the work I was doing in marketing to be meaningful, you know, in terms of you're not promoting and selling people on material or perhaps meaningless things. And I took that job to so that the work I was doing in marketing in that space did have a meaning. Uh, and it's something we go back and forth on. For example, at my company, my marketing company, about a year ago, we decided we've all been involved in nonprofits. And, and so there was a strong desire to do more than just launch products and launch products more meaningfully. So there are a few ideas around that, you know, maybe it's, you only launch products that are B Corp or have, you know, eco-friendly or sustainability factors, or uh, there's, there's, you could give up a day a week for pro bono support of charities, or do you want to take some of the profits you have and reinvest them in, in doing good with, with nonprofits or early stage organizations that are making the world a better place? Uh, we decided about a year ago to, to take, money we had and and invest that in nonprofits. So we I launched a, a, a foundation to to do that to repurpose some of those those profits. But it, what I'm getting at there was the decision of, well, at what point do you want that balance? You know, we have the decision, I could say, Okay, well, we'll spend a day a week, giving off the time for free to a nonprofit. Or the other question was, well, we could spend that day working on campaigns that will, you know, maybe it's not the most meaningful product or maybe it's uh, not the most sustainable product, but if it delivers the, the financial support that you can then redistribute to people who are doing more meaningful things. I think I look at it like that. Uh, I certainly don't look at it like manipulation. I understand where you're coming from with that. And obviously if you go to a look at any copywriting resource, you're going to see, you know, NLP and, and how you can approach the, 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 the consumer. So I, I get that, but I, I don't see it as manipulation. I think from my standpoint, it's more, who can you provide this? Who can you give this value to? It's not for me to judge whether they should have this product or not, but it's just explaining and, ed and educating the consumer as to why this product can be valuable to them and having them make their own decision on it. And then, as I said, kind of at the back end of that, at the completion of that sales process or the, the launch campaign, what can we do to make a difference? Well, we can take, you know, some of the money we make from these 
companies and, and give them to people who really need it and can really use it. So it's, a, it's kind of the, the, the question uh, you ask yourself of, you know, would you rather be Bill Gates and have all this money that you can you get really, really rich and then distribute that money? Or do you go straight into the nonprofit space where there's not a lot of money to be had, but you're spending your time, your labor in that area? And as it stands right now in my life, I guess I've decided to go the route where I can build a business, a financially strong business and, and in what I feel is, is ethical marketing, you know, without being dubious and unethical. And then make sure that whatever rewards we reap from that are being reinvested in a, in a positive way and try and create that balance really. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, obviously it's, it's a personal and professional journey for anyone who is, you know, got a functioning cortex and that's important for you, mm -hmm. you know, and I think, you know, for, for, for me, just having worked for so many different agencies for so long, um, I probably am more jaded, uh, but I do agree with you in trying to do what you can to be, uh, helpful to try to make a difference to try to make an impact and every once in a while i'll you know kind of crawl out of my cave and try to find a nonprofit organization to say you know i'd really like to you know strap a jet pack on you if you're receptive to it can you you know are you interested in this mm -hmm. sometimes they are sometimes they aren't um let me get into launch marketing can you define for the, the, the lay person who may not understand the difference between, well, first of all, what is launch marketing and then how is that different from what we consider traditional marketing? And then you can get into digital marketing if you like. Sure. Uh, there's, a, there's actually no definition of launch marketing. I actually kept, made one up because I'm currently writing a book and, and in, in that book, I wanted to define launch marketing. So I did. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly how I defined it now, but I can certainly talk about uh, the differences between launch marketing and kind of general ongoing marketing. The main difference I see is the, the time factor. Uh, with launch marketing, you have very little time to make decisions. When you're if you think about marketing a regular Shopify store, you can put a little bit of budget in on Monday, see what happens, and then make a decision. Okay, what do we do on Tuesday? You can put a little bit more budget in for a month, step back, assess the results, and, and kind of make your changes and go from there. It's a, it's a slower, sustainable growth where you're getting real-time data on how your marketing is performing. With launch marketing, you don't have that the benefit of time. You don't have the benefit of uh, seeing real-time data as much because – most launch campaigns are going to want a big, successful launch day, whether that's 100 customers or 1,000 customers or 10,000 customers. They want to see success. They want to see traction. And that means that a lot of the work to acquire that traction has to be done beforehand, before you're seeing something. That's data. key. That's key, what you just right. said. Right. Before you collect data, before you real-time sales data. So you have to you have to – Number one, make a lot of predictions because you don't have the actual data in front of you uh, in your preparations. And secondly, you just don't have time, as I said before, to just to waste. If if you have a launch campaign, a crowdfunding campaign, for example, and you get something wrong in your strategy, you don't have a week to solve it. You you, have, you, you might maybe you have an hour to solve it. Quite literally, on launch day of a crowdfunding campaign. You have no time to waste. If you get something wrong, you have very, very little time to fix it. So if you launch a strategy on your e-commerce store, uh, which does so-so, uh, that, that's okay. You live and you learn. You've got your other work happening. You, if you're an e-commerce store, you have credibility probably and history and customer base and other channels. But if you're launching, you don't have any of that stuff. So if you get it wrong, you're in real trouble and you have very little time to pivot and make it right. So the speed with which you have to make decisions and the, the lack of data with which you have to make decisions, I think are two key differences in the launch marketing strategies that we implement and the general e-commerce strategies and, and just kind of tie up the loose end there. That's what 
any launch marketing agency should be looking to uh, well in advance of launch. They, they should be aware of both those factors and implementing strategies to allay, to reduce the risks. So for example, you can't collect sales data before you launch because you're not selling anything yet. But there is a lot of data you can collect to understand purchase intent. And so anyone launching should be doing a lot of work beforehand to understand purchase intent so that they know they're on the right path and minimize their risk of, of launching something incorrectly and, and not getting the sales they want. And when you're talking about purchase intent, you're talking mm -hmm. about the purchaser, the ideal consumer, your uh, customer avatar, right? Correct. Yeah, we're talking about, let's say I'm in the market for uh, a new business, a new business book. Um, I think there's a big difference between someone who sees, sees a, a book and maybe they sign up to a newsletter to hear more about the book or from that author uh, versus someone who is willing to get their credit card out and kind of act on that intent, turn that interest into purchase and buyer intent. So for most people launching products, there's a big difference in someone saying, yeah, this is a cool product and someone who's going to get their money out and give you money on the day you launch. And it's up to the marketer, if it's a marketing agency, during that pre-launch stage to have a real good grasp of that purchase intent so that when they go live, that excitement, uh, they can be confident it translates into buying rather than people just saying, yeah, this is kind of cool, but yeah, I'm not going to actually buy it, you know, not window shoppers. Yeah, I think um, when we talk about launch marketing, um, I, I don't know what the best analogy for it is, but there's so much at stake. There's so much uh, mm. when you're a new business financially, you've got tremendous amount on the line where you've got to be uh, I hate to use the term agile, but you've got to be very, very, um, you've got to really, you've got to have some kind of plan before you begin. You have to validate and make sure that there's a way to generate regularly recurring sustainable revenue. Right. And it seems like a no brainer. I mean, it's having a grocery list before you go to the grocery store, but it's amazing how many uh, new businesses don't have that which kind of takes me to my next question. How can business owners and entrepreneurs new to marketing validate their product or idea for a business before investing time, energy, you know, financial resources? Where do they begin that process? Because it can be a lot to unpack. Mm -hmm. There's so many different factors. Right. When, when anyone's starting out with an idea, I think they want to formulate one or two really critical hypotheses about this, about this product idea. And those hypotheses could be something like, I believe product X will be interesting to consumers at $99. And they have, you know, product X is whatever they want, you know, whatever they're creating, the color, the accessory, the size, whatever it is. And they just need to start with that hypothesis and be crystal clear that anything they're doing around validation uh, focuses on answering that one hypothesis. There are things people often think about, like which ads will work better, which creative or images will work better. And don't get me wrong, they're important, but are they critical in proving or disproving this one hypothesis? And I don't think they are. You need to understand, do people, are people going to take the action I think they're going to take? Are they going to purchase this product? So a couple of simple ways that you can do that. Number one would be, uh, I, I think it's, uh, if you've ever been to Startup Weekend, they, they put you out on the street and, uh, and send you out for the morning with your product idea and get you to come back with as many people as possible who have kind of given you $5 or something uh, to reserve your product when it launches. So you're going on the street, you're talking to people, you're saying, you know, sign up if you're interested uh, and better yet, give us $5 now and we'll reserve your place for this product. 
And it's a big ask, you know, at the time you maybe got a sheet of paper with your product idea on. So you're not going to get many people giving you money, but, but that's, that's a great concept of validation. Anything where you can get cash handed over to you, not just interest. Uh, so a more applicable way of doing that for some people might be running a simple uh, kind of advertising funnel on their website. So for example, most people, if they're launching a product, are going to have a web page and that's going to show their product. And what you can simply do on that web page is have some sort of function to have someone put a dollar down, two dollars down, five dollars down to give them access to you know, a big discount when you launch or be the earliest adopter or whatever that incentive is. And you can run a simple ad campaign. You can use Facebook advertising to target your audience, maybe Google, uh, just to drive some traffic there. A few hundred dollars in advertising budget could be sufficient to get some early data. And you've got to see, well, how many people are actually taking action on this offer and are prepared to give me that single dollar or five dollars. And and that's for me is validation. Asking your mum or your dad or your friend or your sister is not validation. You know, it's asking strangers on the internet is a great validation tactic. Yeah, and if you did that in, in coordination with uh, social media and maybe a Kickstarter campaign, I don't know who's better today if it's uh, Kickstarter or India, what is it? India go, go. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure who's better or if you can play them off each other. I don't know if you can use multiple ones in, in, you know, hand over hand. I don't know. Um, but I think that's absolutely valid. If, if I can add to just Sure. So Kickstarter and Indiegogo these days, great platforms, but I, I don't think they are the, the validation platforms they used to be in the sense of, Five years ago, if I had a product idea, I could quite literally launch a Kickstarter campaign within a very short time frame with very little money and see if it would be successful. Now, because it's such a competitive space, people launching big campaigns come with big money. And so most folks in the crowdfunding space have introduced their own validations prior to a crowdfunding campaign because crowdfunding campaigns, if you want to raise $500,000, you're going to be spending 100K easy on, on, on making that money, making that revenue, which a lot of people don't have. And so any uh, marketing, launch marketing agency in that space is now implementing a validation period themselves. So in those validation periods, entrepreneurs can, can validate their product for maybe a, a $5,000 cost rather than trying to validate their product with Kickstarter or Indiegogo. And then if they get good data and they feel confident, then they can you know, feel good about investing more money, more time and really going all in on that Kickstarter campaign. Cause it is a, they're wonderful platforms, uh, but they're, they're expensive these days to, to prepare for and run big campaigns on. And so they don't quite work as that immediate validation, but oftentimes, as I say, people are doing their own little validation, getting that confidence and then going to the crowdfunding platform for that bigger consumer market validation. What do you think is the single biggest or most important piece of advice you would impart to an entrepreneur seeking to launch their own product or business? As you know, if you look at forums on Facebook or Reddit or what have you, you could literally see thousands of questions every day, at least I do, mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. same question. You know, how do I, I have an idea for a business? How do I get this going? Or how do I start a business overnight? What's the biggest piece of advice that you'd give somebody seeking to start their own product or business, just in general terms? I mean, back to what we just said, they have to validate it. The, the volume of people who have an idea and spend a lot of money and a lot of time on that idea without actually proving that idea is something the market will respond to. The number of people that do that is astonishing and, and the failure rate is high. So to avoid sweat and tears and financial loss and time loss and stress, every entrepreneur would do, would do themselves a lot of good by just before they invest anything too much, they can take their idea that's on the back of a napkin, you know, and just, run something, go out to people on the streets, go to a startup weekend, run a couple of hundred dollars on ads to a simple web page. Anything that will 
give you data to prove people are going to buy this solution at the price point I want them to, uh, before you then start investing more money, investing more time and, and taking the next step. So it's as simple as you have an idea, go beyond your mom and dad, go beyond your family, your friends, get proof that people are going to respond to this idea before before setting up your LLC, building out your entire website, by setting up your mm. social media channels, whatever it is, get that validation first. That's what I would say. Yeah, and and uh, I, back in the day, we used to call it proof of concept. Right, exactly. I remember uh, quite some time ago, uh, I don't know what was in my head, but um, I had actually received training to be a court mediator. Okay. And so I was, I went through the process. I actually volunteered for a few nonprofits, uh, several different court systems in Colorado. So I was mediating real court cases through real organizations for like two years. And after two years, I felt confident that I had sufficient experience. Here's the crazy idea. I'll start a nonprofit organization to help underserved communities resolve court disputes mm -hmm. through mediation and work in coordination with the courts. Mm -hmm. That whole thing lasted about another two years. Okay. And well, then one day, my wife, being the genius that she is, just said, you need to take this behind the shed and you know just put a bullet you know behind the ears and, and kiss it good night i never operated it at a loss mm -hmm. which is saying something i guess for a new business but it never really made any revenue mm -hmm. and this was quite some time ago so if i knew then what i know now it would it would have been completely different but i was i loved the work i believed in the work and I felt like it was extremely important, but I wasn't, and I still think that, but mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of the resistance to the community or through, mm -hmm. the, through the specific court systems, you know, the, the, what you'd run into, mm -hmm. you know, with, with marketing. I wasn't aware of it. And I remember another mediator telling me when I discussed it with him, and he said, that's not going to work. It, you, you won't be able to do it. And I said, why? He said, A, the people here don't know what mediation is. B, they're conditioned to want to go to court and fight, even if it bankrupts them. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just so ingrained in that. And he said, also, you're going to have pushback. There's going to be one court system that will work with you in this one particular city, but then the other neighboring city they won't even respond to your phone calls or emails. And I just said, well, I'm really good at marketing. I can do this. Made my website number one locally, you know, on Google because no other mediator had a basic mm -hmm. website with SEO. But after two years of mediating several divorce cases that were large, mm -hmm. um, very, very stressful too. I just, yeah, I, I told my wife, yeah, you're right. Well, there's, with nonprofits, often there's a lot of stakeholders. There's more stakeholders than something where it's just. And that was problematic. Consumer. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that's another thing where so many people, and myself included at that time, I had to learn the hard way uh, that, yeah, for a nonprofit organization, the stakeholders are like, what's that phrase, uh, you know, herding cats? Mm -hmm. You know, each one wants to go in their own different direction. So yeah. it's just. Mm -hmm. Unless they're family members, you can't really get them to agree in which which way the sun comes up in the morning. Right. So it, I still love mediation. I still believe in it. Um, I would, if it weren't for COVID, I would probably still be active mediating a dispute every once in a while uh, just because of that. And it's great. It's a great way, actually, to resolve court disputes without going to court. But do you... In that training, it sounds to me like you would learn some pretty useful and interesting kind of negotiation skills and tactics. Was, is that is that what what was going on there? Or? Yeah, it's pretty much that. Um, there, I remember one particular case where it was a child custody dispute, and they were a young couple in their 
maybe early 30s, I think. And they just had the most adorable little uh, five-year-old boy, just as cute as he could be. You know, you just want to, you know, take him to the park and let him run run wild and have fun. And so it was very difficult. All their, they could not be together for more than 10 seconds without just trying to tear each other's throats out. Oof. And they would do it in front of the child. So mm -hmm. they wanted, uh, they were fighting over uh, custody of the boy. And you could see how that could have happened with their personalities. Yeah. There's a lot of resentment had built up. And th I remember they showed me the letter. They had like a formal letter for, on stationery from the Judge Judy TV show. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And they were scheduled to appear on Judge Judy. And I said, well, that's great. Uh, are you excited about that? Oh, yeah, we're so excited. And I said, you understand, you're going to be on television and people around the world can see this, not just in the U.S., but all over the world on YouTube, everything. And she can pretty much tell you this is what we're going to do. And that's it. Whether you like it or don't like it, it's over. Whereas with me, you can negotiate. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing. You can negotiate. Yeah. You know, and I'll go back and forth and talk to you individually, talk to you as a group. The child is not involved. And we've got someone from Child Protective Services who can watch the child, make sure everything is done above board and um, and all that. So they decided, OK, we'll go with that. But, yeah, it was basically working with the two different personality types yeah. and saying, well, what can we agree on that? have paramount importance that are non-negotiable to both parties yeah yeah so that will be our list right there and that's where, where we'll take it and that's how we basically hammered out um a custody arrangement how that would how that would work how they would do it so yeah there's the the enjoyment is not so much in hearing the problems as it is Think you know, I was a part of stepping in and trying to help two people mm -hmm. who were basically clueless, you know, what's running around like chickens with their heads cut off. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to fight for this little boy so he can just have some quiet when he comes home from school. Mm -hmm. yeah, Where are they now? I mean, who knows? Um, but that was, that, speedy, yeah. yeah, I learned a tremendous amount from that failed startup. Yeah. So when yeah. I would talk to other startup founders in the nonprofit sector, I could look at it from that perspective and say, wait a minute, <laughs> you have no idea what, what you're in for, mm -hmm. you know, from all of these different facets, from the yeah. board of directors to what you're doing on a daily basis. And after mm -hmm. doing that for two years, I just decided to do what I really loved and what was more creative and more fun, which was digital marketing, web design, the nuts and bolts of that, and kind of doing what I did in mediation, but for business owners. Yeah, I mean, my point to the question around negotiation was, uh, was alluding to that's a lot of marketing is, is about that, you know, negotiation, yeah. persuasion, understanding uh, personality types. Uh, there is that element to it. So I, I enjoy listening to and reading a lot of those kind of negotiation type books because I think they give you really useful insights into sales and marketing. They do, getting to yes. Um, and I've been out of practice. I haven't mediated a case in, in a few years. And with mediation, you go into the fray. I have, you either go in saying, I'm a mediator, I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So we have to work out a contractual agreement that we're then going to take to a lawyer or a magistrate or a judge for approval. Mm -hmm. Or you go in and have a lawyer present with you who's going to basically oversee putting together the official document. Mm -hmm. And with the court system, you usually have the lawyer there with you present. While, so one negotiates, the lawyer makes sure that, yes, this makes legal sense and can be done. Then you take it to be signed off on. So, yeah, one of the biggest things that I said was, you know, you, you can be right or you can have resolution, but you can't have both. <laughs> so, you yeah, know, that's yeah, that's a tough one. Where do we have the middle ground there? So you can be 50% right, 
but you can't yeah. you can't beat this other person into submission you're yeah. not going to stand over the situation and say i i whipped you you know mm -hmm. so let me ask you uh what are some common attributes across some of your most successful launches so that those tuning in can learn yeah i would i would say a couple of a couple of important attributes come to my mind one would be <clears throat> closeness to your product as the as the founder and by that i mean especially with pre-orders and launches where you haven't done anything before there's no history of the brand people are trusting you as much as they are the product and so it's, it's really important and we see a massive difference in the success of launches when the founder is someone who's willing to communicate frequently with the customers or potential customers answer questions pick up the phone speak to the potential customers be the one responding to ad comments be the one responding to emails that closeness and that bond that's created between the founder and these earliest 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 adopters is critical in giving them that launch trajectory because that's that trust factor that the you can only get trust as a pre-order as a launch campaign with no pre-existing history uh, by you as the founder really pushing that and showing that and so i would say as the founder as an entrepreneur you know being among your prospects being among your customers you can't be you can't be stood aside stood away you can't be anonymous uh, some some clients come to us and they don't want to use their name you know they might want to use just a company name rather than their personal name uh, and you know you're not you're not apple or nike you can't do that you yeah. have to show your face you have to be yourself so i'd say that's a big one the second one is just i would say kind of preparedness or willingness to invest in it and i don't mean financially necessarily but the time the energy uh, the the effort the late nights and I'm just talking about the marketing, you know, the stories I hear of manufacturing production, absolute could be nightmarish. So you've got to be committed. You've got to be prepared for what's going to be a heck of a difficult, difficult journey. Uh, and from my standpoint, that means being responsive, you know, being transparent, being communicative. It's very difficult for launch marketing agencies to do their work if or for any anyone involved in the space to do their work if we're not getting constant feedback constant conversation you know easy access to to the founding team uh so our preparedness willingness to commit i think are big ones and if if you've got a job and you, you can't work 10 hour days on on a startup then finding people uh, who can work with you and, and maybe having a few members of your team or who can contribute a little bit of time but at the end of the day, if you want to launch your product with the kind of strategies that we launch with and you want to get success relatively quickly, then you just you have to find those hours, whether it's you, whether it's multiple team members, whether it's outsourcing it. You have to find those hours and that time uh, to commit to the launch. So I would say those are two pretty big attributes uh, that we see. And... As I kind of alluded to before, just to touch on, it, it does take, especially 2021, 2020, 2021, these, these last couple of years, it takes money. That's, that's such a stupid quote, but it takes money to make money in this launch, especially in the launch space. It's competitive. Advertising is expensive now. Uh, the platforms are over, uh, have, have so many advertisers and they're all auction based. So it's just an expensive process. Uh, to to get that visibility and get that early traction so any effort you can do to build your confidence collect that validation data to give you that impetus and and, and feel secure in the bigger investment you're going to make in your launch is, is critical and anyone that does that work uh, early on to validate to prove concept is going to uh, have much more success as they proceed through their launch because they're going to know that they're investing in something which is has a high chance of success. Are there any, uh, I would say, trends of note that you're seeing in uh, launch marketing today 
maybe if they intersect with digital marketing? Yeah, I, I absolutely. Maybe a few years back, you'd be looking at a lot of different channels, acquisition channels, marketing channels that would drive revenue and, and customers to your campaign. And those channels have narrowed. For example, five years ago, PR used to be a big driver of, of revenue uh, for these launch campaigns. Unfortunately, the industry, especially pre-order launch industry, people have been burned uh, by, by products not being delivered or things not working. And so people are much more uh, hesitant and PR companies, or sorry, media companies are much more hesitant in promoting product until it's it's out there in the market. So for people launching, it's tough. And the customer is a lot more skeptical. So again, a PR piece may give you a bit of credibility, but it won't necessarily give you the purchase that you're looking for. So the, the, the number of channels you can, diff you can focus on have narrowed. And the ones that remain, essentially advertising is a big piece of that. Facebook advertising, Instagram advertising, Google advertising. As the commerce space has grown, they've become more competitive. So the ones that remain are more expensive to use. And that, that, that applies to e-commerce as well. People running advertising for e-commerce, after they've launched, it's more expensive now, especially this year. And so as an entrepreneur coming at the launch, uh, coming at the launch period, they just have to be prepared for that. And I think uh, one of the biggest differences that most folks should consider is the uh, recency of how they compare themselves to other, to other people. It's very easy to look at campaigns in 2016, 2017, 2018, you see a $10 million Kickstarter campaign, you think, oh, you know, my product's better than that. I could do that. Uh, that, that doesn't happen anymore. You, you know, you, you need not without a heck of a lot of investment and big teams. Uh, so I think that the, the focus and the different channels that can be used for product launches has reduced. And therefore, uh, there's more and more people focusing on the what remains, and it's just become more competitive and, and more expensive. Uh, so that's a trend I think anyone who's been involved in advertising in particular can uh, will recognize as I'm talking about this, because the last few months in particular have been a, a bit of a, a test for some of these ad platforms. Uh, so that's the, that's the challenge we're facing. That's the challenge entrepreneurs are facing is, is how can we be more diverse again? How can we get more channels, more different marketing efforts uh, become more important and do deliver more value than, than what they currently do now? Because now everyone's leaning on a handful of channels to do all the work and that's good for the, the advertising platforms. So they're making a lot of money, but it's tough for the consumer, for the, for the entrepreneur because it's costing them a lot of money to get in front of their customers. Yeah, and you can spread yourself too thin very easily. Mm -hmm. um, let me just ask you, I only have about two or three more questions for you. Um, how can startup founders and entrepreneurs prioritize or let's say better pinpoint their idiosyncratic strengths. I guess in marketing, we used to call that your USP or unique selling proposition. How do you think that they can better zero in on that? I still call it USPs. Yeah. Unique selling propositions. From our standpoint, when we're launching, that's the first thing we're focusing on. So I talked about approaching this with a hypothesis before, when you validate a product, you want to have your key hypothesis. I kind of you imagine um, under that umbrella, the hypothesis umbrella, just below that you have your unique selling propositions. And what's really important with launches is even if you have 10 unique selling propositions and maybe you've got lots of things about your products that's different. When you launch, in our opinion, your focus has to be on which is the most important, which is the most viable, which can give you the best possible return. And so it's really important in the early validation phase to understand what is it about your product, which of those propositions is most attractive to the most people. So a couple of examples, I talked earlier about you can have a landing a web page. 
maybe you could have three web pages, one that focuses on each different proposition and see which performs the best. Or maybe you people that come in and express their interest in your product can get a survey or a poll where they're self-identifying what it is about this product that they want, what problems it will solve, and you're using that data uh, kind of to loop it back into your marketing. And you're using that information to, to create new ads, new pages, new content that focus more specifically on the, the propositions that people are identifying as the, as the main ones for them. So really important. Uh, secondary, secondary to only, uh, is someone going to buy this thing? Is what is it that's causing someone you know, to buy this thing? Right. Well, I really enjoyed um, our conversation. If uh, listeners or viewers would like to know more about your services, how uh, can they best get in touch? Sure. I mean, you, on the website, russellmarketing.co, you can go check, check it out and there's a form there to be submitted or you can contact me directly. Feel free. Will at russellmarketing.co. Find us on social channels. Uh, we're, we're open to any of those communications, but I would recommend anyone who's interested in this conversation to take a peek at the website, russellmarketing.co, just to get a better idea of what that launch system looks like and whether it's something that might work for you. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation and I hope that uh, anyone listening or uh, watching this online can benefit from it equally. Thank you so much for your time, Will. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Absolutely. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.